Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature. We would like to thank the sponsors that made this event possible. The City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, the Iowa City Public Library, Prairie Lights, Iowa Public Radio, the Graduate Hotel, and Think Iowa City. Between events, be sure to visit the book fair at March, right next door to the public library on the pedestrian mall. There you can visit with publishers and authors. The vast majority of book festival events are offered without charge, but they are not free. Your financial support gives us the ability to offer programs like this festival. Please consider donating to the City of Literature by visiting iowacitybookfestival.org and clicking on support or scan the QR code on the back of your festival program. Today we will hear from poet John Katie. John Katie has published more than 10 books of poetry and has received the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, and the Frank O'Hara Award for Poetry. He has also published books on Ludwig Wittgenstein, Philosophical Skepticism and Poetry. He is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Today he reads from his most recent collection, Beyond Belief. Please help me welcome John Keith. Very much. Great. That's a, that sounds. Can you hear me okay? Thank you all for coming. It's, it's always such a pleasure to read at Fairy Lights. And, uh, I think I was last year in 2016, so it's been a while. Um, I'll read from this uh, new collection of poems called Beyond Belief. And I'll begin with a, uh, I'll read for about 25 or 30 minutes and then uh, we can have questions and chat if, if you'd like. Um, I'll start with a poem called, What Was Poetry? And it has an ep as an epigraph, a remark of James Schuyler's, which goes, I hate Christmas, but I hate people who hate Christmas even more. <laughs> What was poetry? No one really knew, though everyone knew what it should be. And now it's just a way of being famous on a small scale. It was supposed to be significant for its own sake, though that was never entirely true. Human feelings got in the way. For while it was possible to remain unmoved in the face of all that language, no one really wanted to. They wanted to talk about it, to explain what it had let them see, as though the world were incomplete before poetry filled it in. And now there's nothing left to see. Oh, poems come and go and everyone complains about them. But where there used to be arguments, there's just appreciation and indifference, measured praise that's followed by forgetting. I'm as bad as anyone. Instead of reading, I reread. Instead of seeing, I remember. And instead of letting silence have its say, I fill it up with talk as if the last word might be anything else. And yet, despite all this, it matters. Sometimes in the midst of this long preparation for death, that initial solitude returns and the world <laughs> seems actual and alive as it assumes its opposite. I think the truest thoughts are always second thoughts, but who am I kidding other than myself? I hope there's someone that it casts its spell beyond the small cone of light hovering over my desk, and that what started out one night so long ago in silence doesn't end that way. 
I fantasize I can hear it somewhere in the realm of possibility, but only now and then in intervals between breaths. This is a poem called The Wonder of Having Lived Here a Long Time. It's a, a kind of memory poem that uh, begins, starts out in San Diego, where I grew up. The wonder of having lived here a long time. Whatever happened to joke shops? I remember two of them in downtown San Diego, one on the corner of Broadway, not far from the library, that specialized in off-color signs, like a guy sheepishly imploring, we don't swim in your toilet, please don't pee in our pool, or a tall Texan proclaiming, the highballs are on me. The other was on F Street, next door to the Hollywood burlesques, marquee, celebrating Tempest Storm, with a sign in its window offering $15 for 1945 pennies, which I started looking for until it hit me, 1945 meant 1,945. Anyway, they're both gone now. While here I am, inhabiting a moment that supposedly was buried in those moments I spent looking through their windows 60 years ago, although I don't believe it. I'm supposed to be a part of nature too, as subject to its principles as particles and stars. I know time isn't real and everything that happened happened 13 billion years ago when all of this somehow occurred. I realize they, these things and yet that deep down, I think they can't be true. I wasn't even real then you know, and in a while I won't be real anymore. Like the joke shops and Tempest Storm as things turn into time and disappear, though so she's still here. And while that might be just the way things seem, it's the way they seem to me. It feels like such a miracle, this life. I wrote that in a poem six years ago, and I repeat it now. I've no idea what other people feel as they get old, but I feel nothing but amazement, not at what I am, which is commonplace and ordinary, but that I am and have a life at all, the private one of these appearances beyond the reach of physics. Though they take the form of time, they're really nothing but myself, the pages of a narrative that led the way from childhood to here that no one gets to read unless they want to, pausing to look in the window at the, of the joke shop on Broadway on the way to the library or the one on F Street next door to the Hollywood burlesque, not to mention Tempest Storm. Um, this poem is set a little later than that one, and it's uh, uh, about a, a physicist named Murray Gelman, who developed what's called the, the, the standard model in particle physics. And it's kind of, a, well, I, I guess the poem is pretty self-explanatory, so. I'll just read it. Murray Gelman. He was my idol when I was 17 and keen on physics. I had breakfast with him at a math contest in 1963 in a hotel on Mission Bay in San Diego. I was too starstruck to remember what we talked about, but I remember his seersucker jacket and how young he seemed. I wanted to be like him, think like him, know what he knew, discover what he hadn't discovered yet, and now look at me. Reading his obituary in the Times today, I wondered where that life that used to seem so clear to me had gone, sitting here in our dining room in Milwaukee, which to me in 1963 was just a baseball team somewhere in the middle of the country. A minor poet, light years away from physics, inhabiting his poem. He saw the patterns in the chaos of cascading particles floating in from nowhere like the quarks in Finnegan's wake to fill the openings in some lie group that he dubbed the Eightfold Way that had no reason to exist beyond those slots. Yet there they were, as if those patterns were what made them real. 
What does make anything real? I used to think I knew, and now I don't. It isn't us, though we're the ones who can't stop talking about it since we don't know what it is. I used to think that physics knew, yet now it makes no sense, not for the usual reasons. It's strange, shut up and calculate. But since it can't be true unless there's nothing there, I could go on, but let me leave it there, for, there at breakfast with Mary Gelman on Mission Bay in 1963. Nothing ever came of it, though I remember writing to the president of MIT to ask if I should go there first and then Caltech or vice versa. He wrote back to say that either way was fine. Some things are hidden from us, not because we don't know what they are, but because they're inconceivable until they happen, like the future. The morning light in our dining room has the inevitability of the ordinary, yet, and yet 57 years ago it was as unreal as I was then, as unimaginable as that life I had is now. Sometimes I think the past is all there is. Sometimes I think it's the other way around, that only now is real. The future, though, remains an abstraction, even when we know what's going to happen, like death, especially death. There was supposed to be a different person in this chair. Where did he go? That universal destination, nowhere? It isn't a real question, though it sounds like one. It's merely a feeling of perplexity and calm at the memory I had this morning of someone I had been and someone I was going to become as I was reading Murray Gelman's obituary here in our dining room in Milwaukee. Let's see, this is a, um, it's a poem called, uh, called Daddy, and it refers to Sylvia Plath's poem, Daddy, which it isn't about, <laughs> to, to say it's not about that. Uh, it's actually another sort of memory poem about my father, actually. Daddy, don't worry, it's not what you might think, Daddy. It's what we called him all his life, probably a preference left over from his Texas upbringing. It was a remarkable life. Small town Henrietta, dead parties in Dallas, then Columbia and Juilliard, orchestras in Europe and New York, a Navy NCO who hated officers, officers and then a father figure to the gay interior decorators of San Diego until he died in the saddle on his way to decorate one last room where he was going to move. Yet what I find remarkable today isn't the life itself, but what it might have meant to him when he was old, before he died at 92. He'd call his sister every week and got the Henrietta newspaper, but otherwise it might have never happened. He'd get up early, shower, read the paper, and go back to bed. The rest of the day was waiting for nothing to occur, sitting in his decorated house amid the catalogs and bric-a-brac, dressed in shorts and leather shoes and knee-length socks. A person's life is everything, everything to him, and while I imagined his was too, I never had a sense of what it meant to him at all, neither pride nor disappointment nor regret or just the fact of all that time that makes you what you are. The obsession I have with my own is overwhelming, though it's not important to anyone but me. But his didn't seem to matter to him, though it did to me. Perhaps because the banalities that constitute my life wind up in poems, they magnify its meaning. And since his life was left unformulated, it felt small. But it's the other way around. Their objective insignificance makes them raw materials for art rather than hagiography. And as for rescuing life from time, a poem is transitory too and gone before the life it represents is over. I'm at the Bean House where some photographs Tom took of Henrietta hang on the bedroom wall. There's almost nothing in them, a B&B, &B, a building that was once a courthouse and some trees and cars. 
Years walk by as I sit sipping a martini on the deck and looking at the sky. A life is just the sum of its details, but for a while it's all there is until it's over and there's nothing there. It keeps promising happiness or at least relief from care. And yet its promises don't matter, not because it doesn't keep them, but because happiness and care don't matter in the end. I keep thinking of a picture in picture of him in a chair in the living room, wearing a navy blue suit and holding his favorite cane while looking at the camera with a bland, accommodating smile. Physics tells us information can't be lost and that the time of our experience can't be real. So much the worse for physics, you might say. Common sense prevails and nothing can be more real than an individual life as it unfolds through time. And yet our lives aren't information, but appearances of information. And while appearances seem real enough, they aren't the world. I don't expect you to agree, but I don't care. It's simply a way I have of thinking of myself. And anyway, poems aren't meant to persuade, but just ring true. Maybe it was the nervous breakdown he had in 1962 that made him seem so distant from himself, the opposite reaction of St. Sylvia's, whose life seemed even more intense in retrospect than it had been while she was still alive. I don't want to belong, as Leibniz said of Barclay, to the class of men who want to be known for their paradoxes, yet parts of life seem inconsistent with the rest, although we muddle through. Mother died when he was 82 and came into his own, no longer bothered by the presence of the past as though it hadn't happened, like the way life disappears in death, not in the obvious sense that it's finally over, but as though the conscious part of it hadn't been real at all. Most of us spend our lives inside ourselves with only now and then an inkling of how tenuous they really are. What did persist for a while wasn't his own world, but the one that lay behind it over a century ago. The railroad tracks not far from the house that he grew up in, the wooden water tower standing next to them, the pecan trees in the backyard hiding behind that smile. Uh, this is a poem called The Reality of the Individual Life. As one who thinks of poetry as a way of talking to yourself, I probably do too much explain, but that's what talking to yourself is like. The things you can't explain to anyone are suddenly made clear to no one, as though nobody mattered but yourself. And it's the same for each of us whether you're listening to me or not. An enveloping cloud of not quite language hovering on the verge of sense that puts you at the center of a world that doesn't quite get you, but of which you're part. A world in which each individual life is so completely ordinary and at the same time so extraordinary it never ends until it does. Each individual life eternity in miniature, each life a world. Yet here I am, lying on my bed in the middle of the day, feeling the years tick by with nothing much to say about them as though I'm supposed to. That's the point though, isn't it? Without the sense of an individual self creating time and bounded by it, I wouldn't be real. I wouldn't matter, nor would you, despite our sentiments and appetites and dreams. It's how we differ from our animals, however much we love them. Something you and I know, but Daisy, sleeping at the foot of my bed, can't know. Dream on, Daisy. Um, that's, oh. Um, this poem, the title is the title of a story by John O'Hara, and it's a 
about John O'Hara. I, I read it a week, about two weeks ago, and everyone thought I was talking about Frank O'Hara, which seemed very bizarre given the differences in their lives. Uh, but it's called, oh, it's, it's called a late, late show. And I should have mentioned there's a word in it that's very uncommon, stellification. And it's a word that I read in a, a poem of John Ashbery's called Syringa. And I thought uh, John had just made it up. And then I discovered it was a real word. So I decided to, to use it as a kind of homage to him. And a friend of mine even found it in Chaucer. So I guess it goes back a long time. Late, late show. I never read John O'Hara's stories, but having read them now, they all seem pretty much alike. There's a lot of background and a few remarks before not very much happens, and the story ends, and apparently things are somehow changed. I never even thought of reading them, yet now I like the way they sometimes sound the way I like to think life feels, full of nuances and nothing in which nothing's ever heightened or exaggerated, and something unspoken and unrealized remains. I even like the way they're disappointing, and the way he's disappointed too, inside those Yale dreams he had in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. The reciprocal resentments of the stories he embodied, and the ones he wrote. They're called New Yorker stories now that no one writes them anymore, and no one lives the way they used to live in them or understands the code of conduct they implied for everything one did or said or wrote when almost everything was implied. Hanging on something somebody suggested in a bedroom in the East 80s or left on said to someone sitting next, them, next to them at a late night table at the colony or 21. I began, what, I began by wondering what poetry used to be and what it's now become. It still means everything to me, though to nearly everyone I know, it doesn't exist anymore if it ever did. Sometimes I think I'm terrified that it was all a style, like John O'Hara's or a restaurant's or a way of talking that's had its day and I've wasted my life. Of course, I hasten to say that I don't believe it for a moment and that the fact of its near invisibility is a sign of how much it actually matters. Still, it means that in the last analysis, you're all alone, and that the only proof of its importance is your own. What is this craving for validation? When John O'Hara received the gold medal from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, he stood up and wept, and then retired to Princeton in the life he thought it owed him, to no avail. Stellification comes too late to make a difference if it comes at all because it's always about to happen or because it's over before anyone even notices. Either way, you can't know whether it was real or just an exercise in self-delusion. For whichever it might be, the view from where you are remains the same with nothing to go on but the trying and dying for it to happen again and again. Oh, I'll read two more poems. This is, um, Actually, a lot of the poems I'm reading are about other people, and this one is, uh, <coughs> well, it's mostly about uh, the, a, a former poet and the art critic for The New Yorker named Peter Sheldahl, who um, wrote an article a few years ago about how he was uh, had a very short time to live from terminal cancer, but then he, he seems to have hung on, so the poem's a little bit anachronistic since he's still here. At the time I wrote it, that wasn't supposed to be true. Um, unfortunately, uh, it turned out not to be true. It's called The Day, as in Back In, which was never really there. I dislike the myth of the exceptional past since everyone has one, but let's face it, the 60s really were exceptional, though no one cared at the time and they could seem silly. Remember bell bottoms? Art, politics, and music were aligned for a while, not so much in agreement as in clarity. And though even poetry seemed part of it, that wasn't true since poetry is never really part of anything, though it wants to be. 
I discovered New York poets in 1965 when Lewis brought Peter Sheldahl and Kenward Elmsley to campus to read. And afterwards, we went to a bar off Witherspoon Street where some guys from my eating club yelled, close the door, hairpiece, at Peter as we stumbled in from the cold. It's all jumbled now. The poems we read, the poems we wrote, the poems we talked about for hours and then forgot. I remember Peter saying Clepsidra is the poem of our time on the way to a party at Jane Freilicher's after a reading of John's in New York, and he was right. You'll be so great when you move to New York, Linda told me when I said something catty, though I never did move. I just circled around it as though it were the sun and still do. I haven't seen Peter in almost 20 years, and now he's dying in the New Yorker. Everybody dies, as Stephen Sondheim says in company, and yet it still seems so unreal. We're going to see company in New York in April, but it won't be the same. Peter brought New York back to me as it probably never was, the way it was to me. Reading him that life returned, though nothing in particular returned, since life isn't particulars, but possibilities and ideas of particulars, more real in the abstract and in memory than they were when they were just alive. He said, there's no yellow patch if you have Delft, yet there are three, though there was only one when Bergot died. It made me feel 19 again, and also on the verge of death, as though inhabiting an imaginary state of mind when poetry and the possibility of poetry, New York and the idea of New York were both the same instead of disparate and real. But that was back in the day. <coughs> and I'll read. Uh, oops. I'll read uh, one more poem. That this is the title poem um, from a book. Uh, beyond belief. Uh, there's uh, the last few lines are a paraphrase of <coughs> some lines of T.S. Eliot's in uh, Ash Wednesday. And there's an epigraph uh, with a line from a sonnet of Shakespeare's that reads, the expense of spirit and a waste of shame. Beyond belief. Perhaps it is like lust this urge for something more than what there is. I was brought up Catholic with, with all the superstition that entails. Then we became Lutheran, which was worse since it was supposed to be more literal, which only made it more intense. And then sometime in high school, it all just fell away, leaving me, leaving me with that vague sense of spirituality you wrestle with in poems without knowing what it is. My mother slid into a kind of transcendentalism centered on an Emersonian divinity within. And I guess that I did too, with all these celebrations and deflations of the self embodied in their disillusionments. It's a different sort of religion, one without doctrines or sacraments, although the danger of delusion is the same. The temptation of an inarticulate form of knowledge gathering in the life that hides behind your name. And yet I want that knowledge, even if it's specious, like an expensive spirit in a waste of shame. The same songs linger to be sung, and no matter how demotic, they feel like hymns without the pews. The same perplexities await relief, relief that can't be formulated. The long perspective on yourself and on the world transcends belief Yet it's a superstition too, without being a denomination. Wonder at them both should be enough without making it a question of their nature or creation. And yet that seems so difficult to do. I live here in the space between attention and belief, attempting to believe that leaving everything as it is might see me through. As of course it can, though everything seems like a miracle not a miracle to be interrogated, just a miracle. The hard part is to find yourself at home with where and what you are 
and still remain amazed. The days go by. The morning brings a feeling of complacency. The sense of wonder dissipates and begins to feel like second nature, turning into something you can talk about and even try to understand, an ordinary mystery. But beneath it lies something you could hold in your hand. O oh, you I conjure up to whom I speak as to myself, listen. These arguments and back and forths are what life comes to when you start to wonder what it is. Instead of insight, knowledge, and relief from care, it becomes a voice, the voice of someone talking to himself that he begins to think of as his own. I started writing poetry because in reading it, I thought I heard myself, which made it seem like such an easy thing to do. I didn't realize at first that what appears so settled on the page is just the face of the continuous confusions of the inner life it hides. And, no, and that no matter how, in, how inevitable it sounds, it isn't true. I go on wondering what to say, suspecting all the while that in the end it doesn't matter, because what else is there to do beyond remaining mute with amazement, which I can't, having neither the ability nor the will. I keep saying the same things over and over until they turn into a prayer or an admonishment, an admonishment that feels like a prayer, like someone else's prayer. Teach me to care and not to care. Teach me when to turn around, when to speak and when to shut up. Teach me to sit still. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions or chat or anything you want to, want to talk about. Yes. I don't know how necessary this is, but anyway. Uh, on the whole. Uh, your your lines are longer than most poets. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, and mostly I am being anesthetic, sort of yes. interwoven. Yes, and I wonder if you would like to talk a bit about arriving at that. In, uh, well, there's a, a poem I, I didn't read that's in the book uh, called Elmer Gantry was drunk, which is the, the first sentence of Sinclair Lewis's book Elmer Gantry. Yeah. And it talks about how <coughs> reading first Sinclair Lewis and then other mo moderns like Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Joyce and uh, uh, Virginia Woolf and Dostoevsky and all this, that's what sort of introduced me to, to, modern, to, to literature. And I didn't read poetry until I was uh, in college, modern poetry until college. And it was really the, the, uh, the, that modern prose that sort of lay behind my feelings for literature even when i started writing poetry so i it, just kind of modernism uh proust uh, even thomas pynchon it, uh prose writers as, as much as poets kind of influence the way i i sound and talk think to myself and i think that's the explanation uh, i think the, the, you know the, the, the line in the in that poem goes uh Poetry would come later, but for me, the soul of poetry would always be that underlying prose. <laughs> I think that's the best I can do on that. Yes. <clears throat> um, I want to ask about your like writing process. Do you write a poem? every day or do you just sit down and write little lines or how does it work no I, I certainly don't write every day in fact i uh right now I'd, i write a poem all oh, every one or two months and i've always written slowly when i first started writing i did sit down and write poems <coughs> quickly and frequently and i was sort of writing uh oh you think of them as new york school poems when i was in college and then in uh I got, was getting sick of them and didn't think they were very good. And I read some interviews with W.H. Auden about that time, in which he 
talked about how you wrote six poems a year. And I thought, well, it would be interesting to write a poem that you took really a long time on. So I did write a poem called Domes, uh, which I was reading about Hard Crane and other things. And I worked well over a month on that. And it turned out very well. And, and ever since then, I've had this business of writing just a few lines a, a, a day. And, and, and I usually don't know what the poem is going to be about either. I, I sort of know what the the architecture and length and whatnot is roughly going to be like, but I just sort of make it up as I go on. In fact, I once wrote a, a poem of over 200 lines from the beginning with the last line and working back to the first line. So I had no idea what it was going to be about really, but that's the way I write very incrementally and very slowly. Yes. I find it interesting that you also teach philosophy. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, do you cross back and forth uh, in your writing and in your teaching from one to the other? Uh, do you see a bright line between the two? Uh, well, uh, I, I do. And I, uh, well, now I'm retired from philosophy, so I'm not really working on it regularly and certainly not teaching it. But when I was uh, working on philosophy, uh, and teaching, I, I would do philosophy about half the year, fall and winter, and then switch to poetry in spring and summer. And I would never do them at the same time. And in fact, I, I deliberately, well, the, the philosophy I do is a very uh, kind of science and logic oriented philosophy of language, Wittgenstein, epistemology. And I, I really, deliberately didn't want to write poems about philosophy, though Though now I, I do more just because I think poems is you, you're talking to yourself about whatever you want to, and sometimes I want to talk to myself about philosophy. But no, I did keep them very much separate, though I do have a, just had a book of essays come out called Thought and Poetry, and they're all pieces kind of about the relationship between poetry and philosophy and, and how, how and why they're so different. You mentioned um, one of the Shakespeare sonnets I really like, The Expensive Spirit and a Waste of Shame. And I wondered, are there poems that you come back to um, like cyclically and like, I have to read this poem again, or I enjoy this poet or these poems. Can you m mention any of those? Yes, very much. Well, Wordsworth, the, the prelude in particular, something that's always had a strong hold on me. And, and then, uh, P.S. Eliot, Wallace Stevens, Elizabeth Bishop, and John Ashbery would probably be the, the, the more modern and contemporary poets that I constantly reread and, and reprocess and, and think about. And there are particular poems too. And I, I just finished reading the new book, biography of Eliot, which is about 500 pages long, my second volume of his biography. So yes, the, those would be some of the, the, the big ones. But, I, in fact, this, this book is really uh, largely about the relationship between, I, I, I'm kind of a, a Harold Bloomian in the sense that I think that poetry is really a form of conversation with other poets and previous poets. Uh, and I, I don't think that's the sense that a lot of poets writing today have anymore, but it's very much the way I think of it. It's a kind of conversation between yourself and, and these past figures. How do you decide which poems make it into a specific collection? Uh, all of them, because they take so long to write. Uh, if I, if I, I, I never, I mean, I sometimes abandon poems that I didn't think were going well, but by the time I, you know, get f finished with one, I did, then I'm satisfied with it, I'll, I'll put it in. So it's, it's not as though there's a whole lot of, a lot of it to, choose of it. Now, as, as I say, when I first started writing, I wrote a lot and would throw some out and keep some it. But now, I, once I started this deliberate style of just working on a poem until, you know, I either gave up on it or was okay with it. So. Ah. Yes. Um. 
Could you talk a little bit about um, navigating voice, transparency, and authentic, authentic thought? You, you, your poetry seems to be very um, transparent in some ways, your voice, and yet it's extremely, um, it's extremely constructed. And so that makes a very uh, odd difference to me in, in, yes. in its complexity. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Well, topic. that's something I, I, I try to, to do. So if you feel, if it sounds that way to you, then I, I please, because that's kind of the aim. I, I, I like, as I say, I work on these things very slowly and line by line. And I, I like poems to be locally clear, but to be overall very elusive so you're not quite sure what the whole poem is about but line by line it seems clear and i also like it to seem conversational and natural uh, which is very hard to do i mean it's it's kind of uh, to try to seem very artless and just throw away lines uh, a kind of casualness to it so i think if, if when that when that comes off then it, it sounds I mean, even though I'm talking to, to myself, really, uh, I, I don't write for an audience. Uh, I, uh, uh, but I, I, I like to, to have it sound as though it's clear, and then, but then the next sentence or the next lines might have very little connection with it. So it sounds as though it's just going on in this obscure clarity. But at least that's the idea. Yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Oh, well, thank you. I remember once listening to an interview with Billy Collins, whose poetry actually I, I, I like, but he talked about how he, uh, when he starts with, he starts a poem by thinking, well, what's something that's going to hook an audience in? And then he you know, actually tries to think of that. And I thought, my God, that's the exact opposite of which, uh, what I do, which is to completely ignore the audience. And, just, and so I wrote a poem kind of about that called To an Audience. I was struck by your expression, doing philosophy. I, I do philosophy for half a year. I don't do it the other half a year. But just a moment ago, you sort of said doing poetry too, but it's mostly doing, I, I wonder it's, about that. Well, that, that's the way philosophers, of the sort I was trained, we, we think of philosophy. And I guess this comes out of my kind of Wittgenstein background, who I, I've worked on and written. A book or two on, uh, but philosophy on, on this is very much a, an activity, and in some ways, uh, sometimes even a therapeutic activity in which you're trying to sort of not so much answer questions and problems as to dissolve them or see through them. And uh, well, my advisor, uh, who influenced how I think of this, he he was one of the country's most uh, respected philosophers, but he only wrote three or four papers his entire life, his entire reputation, his name is Rogers Albert, and his entire reputation was based on his conversations with people and engaging in this activity of, of doing philosophy as opposed to working to finish a paper or something like that. So I, it's probably more uh, noticeable in my case where I, I, but I think all, almost all philosophers in the, of the the sort that I was trained, was trained in, you know, think of philosophy really as an activity. Um, and I, I think, I guess poetry, well, I, I don't really think of poetry that as much of an activity that you do every day. I, I think of it as something you, I, I try to, 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 to create some kind of artifact. I mean, that's what I think of poetry as, as doing really. Whereas philosophy, it's almost the opposite. Anyone else? Well, thank you all very much.